Christ invites all to the supper in which he gave, gives his body and blood for the life of the world. Let us ask him, Christ, the bread of heaven, grant us everlasting life. Christ, the bread of heaven, grant us everlasting life. Christ, Son of the living God, you commanded that this Thanksgiving meal be done in memory of you, and reach your church through the faithful celebration of these mysteries. Christ, Christ the bread of heaven, grant us everlasting life. Christ, eternal priest of the Most High, you have commanded your priests to offer your sacraments. May they help them to exemplify in their lives the meaning of the sacred mysteries which they celebrate. Christ, the bread of heaven, grant us everlasting life. Christ, bread from heaven, you form one body out of all who partake of the one bread. Refresh all who believe in you with harmony and peace. Christ, the bread of heaven, grant us everlasting life. Christ, through your bread, you offer the remedy for immortality and the pledge of future resurrection. Restore health to the sick and living hope to sinners. Christ, the bread of heaven, grant us everlasting life. Christ, our King, who is to come, you commanded the mysteries which proclaim your death to be celebrated until you return. Grant that all who die in you may share in your resurrection. Christ, the bread of heaven, grant us everlasting life. Gathering our prayer and praises into one, let us offer the prayer Christ himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Um, let us pray. O oh God, who in this wonderful sacrament have left us a memorial of your passion, grant us, we pray, so to revere the sacred mysteries of your body and blood, that we may always experience in ourselves the fruits of your redemption, who live and reign with God the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Salve Regina, Mater This evening is the uh, last of our Lectio Divinas for this year. We will be looking at a very famous passage of scripture. 
It is the passage that's very, very frequently used at funerals. The souls of the just are in the hands of God. But it's set within, it was taken from the Book of Wisdom. And the Book of Wisdom was a very late piece of the Old Testament. It comes from just before the time of our Lord and maybe even a bit later. It's a very modern, in that sense, piece of, of writing. The Book of Sirach, which we looked at before, we prayed over, it was originally written in Hebrew, but the main translation, the main text we have is translated into Greek. But uh, this text, the Book of Wisdom, was written in Greek. Uh, and that was the language in those days of the Mediterranean world, just as English is very often the common language among people of many different uh, languages. It's sort of a, a common language. So it was Greek in those days. The Jewish people in Egypt and Alexandria were at the center of a very, very strong pagan culture. And they felt a little bit outmaneuvered intellectually. They were people of faith in the midst of a secular pagan society. In other words, they were like uh, Canadians of the present time. We're in that kind of situation. And so they really were needing to think through intellectually how they would be able to respond to the different challenges they were facing. And that's what the Book of Wisdom does. It speaks of the various themes which are very strong in their society, and especially the idea that sort of eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you may die, that kind of uh, idea, and the antagonism to people of faith. And it presented a very profound presentation and a way of looking at things where the immortality of the soul is expressed with great beauty which is one reason why it is used at, at funerals, this passage. The passage itself is about the right length for Lecture Divina, but it doesn't make sense unless you know the previous section. And what he does, the writer, just as we see in much wisdom literature, you have the fool and the wise person compared and contrasted. So in this writing, we see the ungodly, which are the people he is concerned about. The ungodly say, let us look at this uh, good person and see if we can persecute him and put him down. The ungodly say we only have a short time in life and uh, we just do what we want with it and we live a very materialistic life. So he goes, gives a whole series of things in which he speaks of what the ungodly are doing. And um, let us lie in wait for the righteous man because he is inconvenient to us and opposes our actions. He reproaches us for sins against the law and accuses us of sins against our training. He professes to have knowledge of God and calls himself a child of the Lord. He became to us a reproof of our thoughts. The very sight of him is a burden to us because his manner of life is unlike that of others and his ways are strange. We are considered by him as something base. He calls the last end of the righteous happy and boasts that God is his father. And so this is the complaint of the ungodly, who are the ones who are running society in Alexandria and Egypt in that period around the time of our Lord. And so in that context, that's what it means when we start off with a little bit of a, let us test him with insult and torture, that we may find out how gentle he is. Let us see if his words are true. That is, those are the words at the very beginning of the passage tonight of the, of the bad guys. They're trying to test the good person. And then we come into the famous, extraordinary poem and statement of the immortality, which is the gift of God to each of us. And so now, with that context, the first words we hear in this are the bad, the bad people, uh, and they're speaking about the righteous one. Let us now enter into Lectio Divina. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon us, that these words may illuminate our minds and move our hearts and call us to action to change our lives. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful 
Enkindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and we shall be created. You shall renew the face of the earth. O oh Lord, take away from our hearts any distracting thoughts and the burden of sin which weighs upon us that is a barrier to your coming into our own hearts. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And so the ungodly say of those who are just, let us see if his words are true. Let us test what will happen at the end of his life. For if the righteous man is God's son, he will help him, and will deliver him from the hand of his adversaries. Let us test him with insult and torture, that we may find out how gentle he is and make trial of his forbearance. Let us condemn him to a shameful death, for according to what he says, he will be protected. Thus they reasoned, but they were led astray, for their wickedness blinded them, and they did not know the secret purposes of God nor hope for the wages of holiness, nor discern the prize for blameless souls. For God created man for incorruption and made him in the image of his own eternity. But through the devil's envy, death entered the world and those who belong to his party experience it. But the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God and no torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish, they seem to have died, and their departure was thought to be an affliction, and their going from us to be their destruction. But they are at peace. For though in the sight of men they were punished, their hope is full of immortality. Having been disciplined a little, they will receive great good, because God tested them and found them worthy of himself. Like gold in the furnace, he tried them, and like a sacrificial burnt offering, he accepted them. In the time of their visitation, they will shine forth and will run like sparks through the stubble. They will govern nations and rule over peoples, and the Lord will reign over them forever. Those who trust in him will understand truth, and the faithful will abide with him in love because grace and mercy are upon his elect, and he watches over his holy ones. In our own experience of this world, of the difficulty of life and the journey through this valley of tears, these words will speak to each one of us separately and individually. And it's one word of God, but many different lives, many different sets of ears that hear it. And perhaps also in our own experience, not only of the ungodly and of the struggle to be righteous and faithful, honorable in this world, we also have each one of us experienced the pain of grief of those we love who have died. And perhaps these words were read at their funeral. So let's, before we begin to meditate upon the text itself, let's spend a moment of quiet prayer and say, what does this text say to my head that I may know the Lord more faithfully, to my heart that I may love him more truly, to my hands that my actions, my life, my behavior might be shaped by these holy words to take us right into suffering, into the midst of suffering, whether it be that of persecution, whether it be that of grief. How do they affect me and speak to me in terms of my own personal life? Let's pray about that for a moment in silence.
and the ungodly say, let us see if the good person's words are true. Let us test what will happen at the end of his life. For if the righteous man is God's son, he will help him, and will deliver him from the hand of his adversaries. Let us test him with insult and torture, that we may find out how gentle he is, and make trial of his forbearance. Let us condemn him to a shameful death, for according to what he says, he will be protected. This is almost like the servant song, the suffering servant from Isaiah. It is a kind of a prophecy of the passion of our Lord. It is a sign of the one that we know, the totally honorable and good person who came into this world of so much iniquity and experienced what the ungodly say in the Book of Wisdom and responded with gentleness and love and gave us the way then let us see if his words are true. Let us test what will happen at the end of his life. This life that we live is a time of testing. It is going through the desert on the way to the promised land. We're not there yet. And so as we look at our faith and we look at what God calls us to, we remember that the sign of our faith is the cross of Christ. Whenever you have a presentation of faith that is simply shallow with things like love and stuff like that, which are maybe meaningless unless they carry the sacrificial love of the cross, they won't last very long because they are unreal. A faith that is simply unreal is nothing at all. It blows away, it gives a brief buzz. But after all, you say you go back into life and you say, this is not real. But these words are real. These words speak of the experience of life in a world with sin and suffering, the pathway through the cross to the glory of the resurrection, which was fulfilled in the life of our Lord Jesus and which we're called to follow. But we experience this. Let us see if his words are true. Let us test what will happen at the end of his life. For if the righteous man is God's son, he will help him, will deliver him from the hand of his adversaries. Come down from the cross. That's what these words are saying. Leap off the temple and the angels of God will lift you up. It's that kind of very shallow view of what faith means. And it is stronger now than it may have been in the time of the Book of Wisdom. We face it all the time, that kind of view which we live to in the midst of in our country, in our world. Let us test him with insult and torture that we may find out how gentle he is and make trial of his forbearance. Let us condemn him to a shameful death for according to what he says, he will be protected. This is the problem of evil, which has turned some people away from God because their vision of God is of one who will protect us from the suffering we can come to in this valley of tears. But that vision of God is a rather superficial one. And I think any believer may say to an atheist who has that vision of the Lord. I don't believe in the God that you don't believe in because that's not what it is. Faith leads us not around the storm, but through the storm. Think how often Jesus appears in the midst of the storm, not just simply when the people are safe. It's when they're bouncing all over the place, the waves crashing into the boat, that they see Jesus there with them. And the, we see him too. We experience him, and so we should not expect, as we live our life, if we seek to be honorable, living our life with integrity as best we can and repenting of the times we don't, we should expect to find opposition of the type we hear of in the Book of Wisdom. If we don't get that opposition, it may be because we're simply going along to get along and taking that kind of gooey, meringue-like faith 
that's pleasing to one and all, but it has no substance in it. It's just air, sweet sugar and air. But we can't go far living on meringue. It just doesn't have anything staying power. So here we go right deep into this, and the section before that I read to you is even stronger than this. The situation in which we're called to serve our Lord. It is not in a time of peace with no testing. We are going to be tested. We're going to be put to the test, and in that we find our knowledge of our need for God. This is why I keep coming back, and I maybe repeat it all the time. Somebody once said there, trying to time how long it takes in a talk for me to refer to the Lord of the Rings, usually about four minutes and 12 seconds. But uh, it's so true, this, it's so accurate. Because Tolkien was living through the Battle of the Somme, where people, he faced evil like face to face. And he was living through academic uh, wars in the university he was in, which is another version of the Battle of the Somme, much less violent. But he lived in the midst of all that, so he had a great understanding of the durability of evil, and yet that in the midst of that, by taking it straight on, going right through it, one can become purified. So you see, the little furry-footed hobbits are going to make it in the end. They're going to get through there, and the power, the great powers of this world are ultimately consumed in their own negative force even though they may for a time be victorious, and they certainly cause those who are honorable to suffer greatly. And so let's reflect upon that as we hear these words, which can be a kind of a reference in a sense to the crucifixion of the Lord, and apply them to our own situations of life, trying to be faithful and honorable with integrity, Righteous, and that not righteous in the sense of self-righteous. That's, righteous has a kind of a bad tone to it, but honorable. People who try to do the right thing as best they can, who aren't sort of shifty and trying to trick other people, but honorable people. That's what we're called to be. And how do we live that life in a world that is described so astutely? by the author of the Book of Wisdom. Let us see if his words are true. Let us test what will happen at the end of his life. For if the righteous man is God's son, he will help him, will deliver him from the hands of his adversary. Let us test him in insult and torture, that we may find out how gentle he is and make trial of his forbearance. Let us condemn him to a shameful death, for according to what he says, he will be protected. What does that say to our own situation in this world? Thus they reasoned, but they were led astray, for their wickedness blinded them, and they did not know the secret purposes of God, nor hope for the wages of holiness, nor discern the prize for blameless souls. For God created man for incorruption, and made him in the image of his own eternity. But through the devil's envy, death entered the world, and those who belong to his party experience it. Thus they reasoned, but they were led astray, for their wickedness blinded them. And it blinds us. Whenever we get caught up in sin, pride, anger, envy, greed, laziness, lust, gluttony, you name it, it blinds us. It blinds us to who we are. It blinds us to the reality of God. It draws us to a harshness in our relationship with other people because what we often do when we're blinded by sinfulness, is we project onto other people the very things that we ourselves are struggling with. Anger can go across a room quicker than electricity can go through a wire. 
and envy and all these other things. Thus they reasoned, but they were led astray, for their wickedness blinded them, and they did not know the secret purposes of God, nor hope for the wages of holiness, nor discern the prize for blameless souls. Cardinal Newman once wrote one of his earliest uh, sermons that people who are caught up in their own ego would find heaven to be a very boring place because it's all about others and not about self. Whereas if we are living a life of holiness and the Lord says, the Lord God, you know, be holy as I am holy, filled with love, then we will already begin that heaven on earth. We will be living and experiencing now in this world the wages of holiness and the prize for blameless souls. And we will be able to come closer to the secret mysteries and purposes of God. And so each one of us needs to humbly to be attentive to this. Say, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Just repeat that again and again. Let it enter deep into our hearts. Because when we got, get caught up in the sin that is so enveloping, the kind of selfishness which can destroy us and make us bitter, then we are blinded. We do not see God or we do not see other people except as objects which we can control. They reasoned, but they weren't really reasoning. They were led astray. That's one of the words for sin in uh, Hebrew is missing the mark, going into the ditch, going off the track. For their wickedness blinded them. They did not know the secret purposes of God. And maybe this is another way of saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Because if we are experiencing, for example, as people who try to be honorable disciples of Jesus in this world, if we're experiencing the kind of attack which he describes, it's so easy for us to start firing back. That's why I just recently when we had the March for Life, it's always astonished, well, it doesn't astonish me, but it's, I've always noticed that there's a certain point where all the pro-abortion protesters are gathered. And it used to be down the hill, but they blocked us this year, so it was somewhere else. But they're always screaming, hatefully, like ferociously. And I remember we were going along one street, and here we were looking at this people, just earnest souls trying to pray. We were praying, and little children walking along. I remember this one person on a balcony, just screaming, screaming. And there's a great inclination to scream back. You know, say, we're pro-life. But we cannot, we must not do that. That's a dramatic experience. But we must always simply go deeper into silence and prayer. And not say either, as a kind of a, a grenade, I will pray for you. That could be a bit condescending. But pray for them quietly and simply say, may the Lord bless them and keep them and bring peace in their lives. And then quietly move on. It's such a temptation, almost irresistible, when someone's firing at you to fire back. But that's not the way of Jesus. And the more we do that, the more we go deep, deeper into darkness. It takes much more ascetical discipline of the disciple of Jesus to remain gentle, loving, and silent in the midst of this incoming fire than it does to fast for 100 days or something like that. And so whatever we encounter, maybe less dramatically than that one point about halfway through, usually the, the March for Life, we get screaming, screaming. When we experience that in the other things of life, in much less dramatic ways, perhaps, we've got to just say, Lord, help me always to live with integrity, an integrity that's rooted in a gentle love. 
Thus they reasoned, but they were led astray, for their wickedness blinded them, and they did not know the secret purposes of God, nor hope for the wages of holiness, nor discern the prize for blameless souls. For God created man for incorruption and made him in the image of his own eternity. For through the devil's envy, death entered the world, and those who belong to his party experience it. God made man for incorruption. Sounds almost like we can start singing the Messiah at this point. God made man for incorruption and made him in the image of his own eternity. We're made in the image and likeness of God. For one thing, we're made in the image and likeness of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So we're made to live in relationships of generous love. And then we begin heaven now, if we're living like God now. Whereas if we're going the other way, the ungodly, the here, here, where it's like, we're turning inward on self. But we also are made in the image and likeness of the immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light and accessible, hid from our eyes. That's the Lord. And in fact, by the great gift of creation, a man and a woman, a husband and wife, become co-creators with God of eternal life. Think of it. The little child is bound for eternity. There's nothing else humans do that is eternal. But having a child is. So we're participating in the eternity of God, made in the image and likeness of God. That is awesome. And it is the gift the Lord gives to humans. God created man for incorruption, made him in the image of his own eternity. But we always look for the turn. But what's the other side now? In the scriptures, we always have this pushing one against the other so we can understand a bit better. They go down one path and then boom, push the other way. And we see another insight. It's like a diamond keep flipping and turning it, you see through the many facets, different aspects of reality. So you certainly do this in the Psalms. Every two lines are going in a different direction. So we can understand something more profoundly. But through the devil's envy, death entered the world and those who belong to his party experience it. But that doesn't seem to be true because obviously everyone experiences death, not just those who belong to the devil's party which might be taken in several different terms, the devil's party and the devil's party. But what he's talking about here is what in the book of Revelation, the apocalypse is called the second death, the death of the soul, sometimes called mortal sin, deathly sin. Death entered the world by the devil's envy. And there's a story somewhere that the devil was so envious of Adam and Eve, man and woman, living to create new life, to praise God, to do all those glorious things. When he was stewing in his own anger, he got envious of them. So he said, I'll trip them up and lead them to rebel against God and try to be little gods themselves, which is a lie. They're not little gods, they're just humans. And that's, of course, the heart of all sin as we think we are what we're not. So the devil's envy tempts them and Adam and Eve fall. It's just sort of like what uh, Jordan Peterson said very wisely in one of his talks, that this very in profound insight that Cain and Abel were offering sacrifice. Cain's was not accepted, Abel's was accepted. You would think logically that Cain would go to Abel and say, show me how to do it better. But Cain was so filled with envy of Abel that he killed him. That is perhaps a more common response than the reasonable one we might accept. And here we have the devil's envy, spiritual death, death entered this world and those who belong to his party will experience it. The first death is human mortal death. We're all gonna go through that. You never know when. It keeps us alert. 
to be aware of that any day. That's not a gruesome thought, that's actually a rather cheerful one, to say, here I am, Lord, may I say as I, I know this is a good closing nighttime prayer, I don't think it's in any prayer book I've ever seen, but you know, before you flick out the lights, say, my bags are packed, I'm ready to go. That might be, I don't think that's ever gonna get into a prayer book, you know? Maybe the, the one that John the 23rd said, you know, well, Lord, we got worried. And I, you know, sometimes, I know, you know, when you're the bishop of a diocese like this one and you see all the stuff go out there and you oh my gosh, ah! You know, just, I think I should sometimes put on my wall, you know, that's the scream. You see that painting going, ah! You know, and so I, oh my gosh. Anyway, you see that, you see a lot of good, mostly good, but sometimes. But good old John the 23rd said, well, Lord, it's your church. You take care of it. I'm going to bed. <laughs> so that's a very wise bit of wisdom. That's very wise. I know it in my head, but it hasn't yet made it down, but a foot down here to my heart. But I think we all need to look at that and maybe follow it. So all the, like, the bitterness is there. Envy, based upon the devil's envy. Envy, anger focused on people who are trying to live a good life and the little people trying to live an honorable life, picking it up maybe and being that way themselves. We all have that temptation. Then we come to this beautiful, beautiful passage which is proclaimed at many a funeral. After all this struggle and bitterness and everything, but the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God and no torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish, they seem to have died, and their departure was thought to be an affliction, that they're going from us to be their destruction. But they are at peace. For though in the sight of men they were punished, their hope is full of immortality. Having been disciplined a little, they will receive great good, because God tested them and found them worthy of himself. Like gold in the furnace, he tried them. Like a sacrificial burnt offering, he accepted them. In their time of their visitation, they will shine forth, will run like sparks through the stubble. They will govern nations and rule over peoples, and the Lord will reign over them forever. Those who trust in him will understand truth, and the faithful will abide with him in love, because grace and mercy are upon his elect, and he watches over his holy ones. But the souls of the righteous, of the just, of the honorable are in the hand of God and no torment will ever touch them. But he just goes and says all kinds of torments touch them. We're in the midst of torment, but they won't touch them in the sense of getting there to the heart of who they are. For they are in the hand of God in the midst of the fire and the storm of this world. They are like Daniel and those in the furnace with the flames all around them, but protected by the Lord God. They're like Christ on the cross. We're called to look always to the cross of Christ. Evil all around, but from the cross comes not a redoubling of evil or anger or anything else, firing it back the way we generally do, but Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And so the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God. And the righteous, not in the sense of self-righteous, the people who are trying to live an honorable life. The hand of God. The hand that shapes in creation. The hand that guides. The hand that sustains. Very often in Christian and in Jewish visions and art, the hand, certainly in Christian art, not in Jewish, the hand represents God the Father. The providence of God. It represents the providence of God the Father. The souls of the just are caught up in the providence of God. As one great saint said, the one thing I know for sure is that each day God's providence rises before the dawn. And no torment will ever touch them. Not get to them. It will touch them, obviously, in different ways, but not touch them profoundly. In the eyes of the foolish, they seem to have died, and the departure was thought to be an affliction. 
and they're going from us to be their destruction. And that's still a common view. I mean, this is why the Book of Wisdom is so relevant, I guess we say. I mean, this stuff you get on the, you know, the kind of, uh, you might say, evangelical atheists of the modern age are pumping out this stuff all the time. That uh, that's it, lights out, boom, we're just a bunch of clay. And I sometimes, I sort of, a poor atheist can't, can't win because one of the things you notice, I, think, I remember seeing one guy brilliantly proclaim the triumph of materialism. There's nothing beyond the material. And he proclaimed it so non-materially. He proclaimed it using his mind, using things which cannot be weighed, photographed, or measured. It's a kind of a self-contradiction there. But that's it. The idea that we're just a clump of earth. We are in a sense, remember you are dust and to dust you shall return. A lot of our life that we cling to as being our final goal is dust. But I wish I could remember the whole poem. Read um, that nature is a Heraclitean fire and the glory of the resurrection by Gerard Manley Hopkins. And he, I, you know, I, I just don't have it in my head, but you know, all this jack straw or something is immortal diamond. And Gerard Manley Hopkins, who wrote the most stunning poetry, he lived a life of consistent failure and suffering. And he died in his 40s. And every assignment he had in his career as a priest, you might say, he kind of fumbled. And because he just wasn't built for what he was put to do. But in the heart of it all, we have a profound, in the midst of the kind of suffering we read about here in the Book of Wisdom, he became holy and purified, burned like the gold tested in the furnace. And that one beautiful thing about fire and the resurrection, just I really recommend, read anything by Gerard Manley Hopkins. But uh, that is sort of, I don't think, I don't know where he picked it up from here, but it's true. But they are at peace. Not the peace that is sort of, you know, there's what there's a poem, the grave's a fine and noble place, but, or something like that, but none I think do there embrace. <laughs> you know, the kind of peace that's just sort of <laughs> flick off the lights. But the peace that is alive, the peace that passes all understanding, the peace that is vibrant, that comes when we are at peace within our own hearts, when we live with integerity, integrity, we're not fighting within our hearts or with other people because it spills out of our crack, cracked hearts to fight other people. The peace that is based upon sacrificial love in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They are in peace. For though in the sight of men they were punished, their hope is full of immortality. Having been disciplined a little, they will receive great good because God tested them and found them worthy of himself. Like gold in the furnace, he tried them, and like a sacrificial burnt offering, he accepted them. That helps us, I think, sometimes when we look at the, the world or the struggles in the church even, or you see all these battles back and forth. Just read the com boxes of, or maybe don't, of... Christian religious blogs and you see, you know, this pure vitriol <laughs> draining out. You think, oh my. Uh, and so in all the midst of all this, we got to say, I don't have time for that. That's a good thing to think about. We're being tested by this world so many ways. And we can't let the struggles we see that we even get angry about, we can't let it touch us, get to us, so we become absorbed in it. We've got to know about it because we've got to navigate through the shoals of this world, but we mustn't let it touch us in the heart. And so this has meant this testing is meant to purify us. 
And that happens with great sufferings. Sometimes if a person suffers greatly, they become bitter and they sink inward. And it touches them in a terrible way. Whereas sometimes people who suffer greatly, they're like, they have to be like that at first. You can't sort of say, I don't notice that whatever it is. But then they're able to come beyond that so that their life can be a life of shalom, of that living peace that is where joy is found. Not a superficial happiness, a meringue happiness by pumping up religious sentiments or talking about glib stuff, but a deep joy in the midst of the fire, tested. And maybe God allows this. He doesn't cause it, but he allows this in the world and sometimes amongst ourselves in the church to call us to greatness, to call us to holiness. Because it seems there's it's always the way it is. And within the church, it's always been that way. Look at the Acts of the Apostles. It's kind of the golden age of the church. Lying, cheating, stealing, the whole bit. There's a lot of testing going on for always, whenever we are trying to serve God. Like gold in the furnace, he tried them. Like a sacrificial burnt offering, he accepted them. In the time of the visitation, they will shine forth and run like sparks through the stubble. They will govern nations and rule over peoples, and the Lord will reign over them forever. Those who trust in him will understand the truth. And the faithful will abide with him in love, because grace and mercy are upon his elect, and he watches over his holy ones. In the time of their visitation, they will shine forth. They have been tested. They will shine like sparks the beauty. They will govern nations, rule over peoples. The Lord will reign over them forever. Those who trust in him will understand truth. And part of the truth is what the people who are bitter understand, or the people who say there is nothing beyond our mortal world. That truth is anger and fear and disaster. That is true, but it's not the whole truth. And it's not nothing but the truth. Those who trust in God will understand truth, as in the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. And the faithful will abide with him in love. This is almost like out of the Gospel of John. It doesn't say the faithful in this lifetime are going to sail along in a kind of happy, happy, happy clappy kind of religion. That's a false thing. It's a synthetic, a ersatz, fake. But that's just not real. Whatever is not real, whatever is an illusion, we should watch out for. But they will abide with him in love because grace and mercy are upon his elect and he watches over his holy ones. The Lord is with us every step of the way. And the way may be dangerous and difficult. It may be stressful, it may test us. Maybe that's why there's a very famous spiritual experience called the Camino, which I've never gone on. I have a friend of mine who's doing it right now. I think I'll read a book about it, have a donut or two, good cup of coffee, and read about people going through the hot sun and marching on till finally they get to Santiago. But it, like every other pilgrimage, is a, it's meant to test. You, you're not sort of, I've thought if I ever, I've said this to my friend who's doing the Camino right now, if I ever did the Camino, I, I sort of foresee myself, maybe one of those sedan chairs where people are you know, get kind of carried along. You know, apparently it doesn't count if you drive the Camino, that doesn't count. You can ride on a horse, it's okay, but you don't get the final shell or something, or mark if you, but I can see myself, you know, with someone with feathers behind, or something, you know, an air-conditioned sedan chair or something, but that misses the point, obviously. Well, it's like the great Thomas More said, when he was going to meet Cromwell, 
Thomas Cromwell. It was a boat he knew. He was going down the Thames there to meet the guy who would throw him in the dungeon, in the tower, and ultimately he knew that he was faithful, he would be killed. And so he said to his son-in-law, Roper, son Roper, we do not get to heaven on feather beds. And he also said, in case we forget what's what and who's who, the devil, that proud spirit, cannot stand laughter. So in the midst of horror with the axeman ready to womp away, he was at peace. And when he was in the dungeon, he said, it is, I'm as close to God here as I am in my home. That's amazing. Of course, nothing tops John Fisher, you know, who was told, wake, they woke him up at about five in the morning and they said, you're going to be beheaded at 10 o'clock. He said, oh, well, still a few more. I'll get a few more hours sleep. Wake me up when it's before. Woo, you know. But in Thomas More is so much at peace in the midst of this testing and horror and all the wicked and people around him that he was cracking jokes and he said, you know, help me up, I'll take care of myself on the way down. And as he put his head on the block, he said, you better aim correctly. I've got a short neck. Better aim right just for the sake of your own reputation. And then whomp. That requires deep holiness that is the kind of thing that requires wisdom, holy wisdom that goes beyond the superficial. And our life is so short, no matter how we live, how long we live, that we don't have the luxury of a foolish life. We must find wisdom, holy wisdom. This is what this is about. And so we should apply it to our own hearts. And so the wicked say, let us see if his words are true. Let us test what will happen at the end of his life. For if the righteous man is God's son, he will help him, will deliver him from the hands of his adversaries. Let us test him with insult and torture that we may find how gentle he is and make trial of his forbearance. Let us condemn him to a shameful death for according to what he says, he will be protected. Thus they reasoned, but they were led astray, for their wickedness blinded them. They did not know the secret purposes of God, nor hope for the wages of holiness, nor discern the prize for blameless souls. For God created man for incorruption and made him in the image of his own eternity. For through the devil's envy, death entered the world, and those who belong to his party experience it. But the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, and no torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish, they seem to have died, and their departure was thought to be an affliction, and their going forth from us to be their destruction. But they are at peace. For though in the sight of men they were punished, their hope is full of immortality. Having been disciplined a little, they will receive great good, because God tested them and found them worthy of himself. Like gold in the furnace, he tried them, and like a sacrificial burnt offering, he accepted them. In the time of their visitation, they will shine forth and will run like sparks through the stubble. They will govern nations and rule over peoples and the Lord will reign over them forever. Those who trust in him will understand truth, and the faithful will abide with him in love, because grace and mercy are upon his elect, and he watches over his holy ones. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, 
now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.